Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another session in our uh, ongoing Greek and Roman mythology series. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to say Happy New Year again. Happy Persian New Year to all of you. Uh, and I really hope that uh, all of your wishes come true in this new year. Uh, we're going to talk about the next item on our uh, syllabus. And uh, this lecture is entirely dedicated to Artemis, another mythological uh, figure uh, whom we are going to discuss in this video. So uh, without further ado, let's get down to business and talk about uh, Artemis. Well, as you can see in the picture here, well, Artemis is known for so many different things. And uh, she's the goddess of uh, Hunt, she's the goddess of virginity, but she is also like paradoxically speaking, she's the goddess of fertility as well. She's known for so many other qualities. She's known as the sister of Apollo, another important mythological figure. And we're going to talk about all of them uh, in due time. But I would like to start uh, today's session by talking about a story from a book called Description of Greece, uh, which a small section of it is dedicated to the analysis and of course the description of Artemis and some of the stories uh, which are about her. And I think this story is kind of fascinating and I will tell you why, but first let's read it. And this is how the story goes. Well, some children, people don't recall exa the exact number, playing around the sanctuary found some rope and having tied it around the neck of a statue, pretended that Artemis was being hanged. So in this story, there are some children who are playing and then, um, you know, they see the statue of Artemis and then they bring a robe, uh, put it like a noose around her neck and pretend that Artemis is being hanged. Now, imagine a goddess seeing this. OK, well, she will be wrathful. She will she will be furious. OK, so the uh, Caffians, when they discovered what the children had done, stoned them to death. So the people of that region, you know, realized that, you know, the children had done that. And so they stoned them to death. A sickness then fell upon the wives of those who had done these things and they gave premature birth to stillborn babies. For this reason, the Pythia decreed that they bury the children who had been stoned and offer sacrifice to them every year since they had been unjustly killed. To this day, the Caffians performed this ritual in accordance with the oracle and call Artemis the hanged goddess. This part of the story, which kind of represents the brutality and the fierceness of the reaction is important for us because as we will see in the course of this lecture, you will, you will notice that Artemis is extremely brutal. She is extremely fierce and harsh, especially when she wants to punish somebody. And we will see this in so many other stories as well. And I wanted to preface today's session. I wanted to bring this at the beginning of today's session so that you will see that, you know, brutality, fierceness, harshness, ferociousness. These are all qualities and adjectives which are associated with uh, Artemis. Uh, there are so many stories and books which discuss Artemis uh, in greater length. Uh, we have previously talked about the Homeric hymns. We said that the Homeric hymns were anonymous books uh, written about mythological figures. There are two Homeric hymns about Artemis, the longer version and the shorter version. And in both categories, in both stories, the essential qualities of her character and appearance are described to us. She is portrayed as this beautiful virgin of the hunt who is armed with a bow and some arrows and she's she hunts all the time. So let's read some parts of this uh, longer version of the Homeric hymn. Okay. I sing about Artemis of golden arrows, chaste virgin of the noisy hunt who delights in her shaft and strikes down the stag, the very own sister of Apollo of the golden sword. She ranges over shady hills and windy heights, rejoicing in the chase as she draws her bow, made all of silver and shoots her shafts of woe. The peaks of the lofty mountains tremble, the dark woods echo terribly to the shrieks of wild beasts, and both the earth and the fishfield sea are shaken. 
but she with dauntless heart looks everywhere to wreak destruction on the brood of animals but when the huntress who delights in her arrows has had her fill of pleasure and cheered her heart she unstrings her curved bow and makes her way to the great house of her dear brother, uh, Phoebus Apollo, in the rich land of Delphi, where she supervises the lovely dances of the muses and the graces. After she has hung up her unstrung bow and arrows, she takes first place and exquisitely attired, leads the dance, and they, they join in a heavenly choir to sing how little of the beautiful ankles bore two children, who are by far the best of the immortals in sagacious thought and action. So Leto is their mother, right? Leto is the mother of Apollo and Artemis. We will talk about her later. And so they sing in praise of Leto, who has given birth, birth to these two great immortal beings. Hail, children of Zeus and Leto of the lovely hair, yet I shall remember you and another song too. So the story is Zeus and Leto, um, you know, uh, have two children, Artemis and Apollo. So that's why they are immortal. Uh, there's a shorter version of the Homeric hymn uh, about Artemis, which, you know, dwells upon the closeness of Artemis and Apollo. So this shorter version focuses on the intimacy that exists between Artemis and, of course, her brother Apollo. Sing, O Muse, about Artemis, the virgin who delights in arrows, sister of Apollo, the far shooter, and nurse together with him. She waters her horses at the river Meles, thick with rushes, and swiftly drives her chariot made all of gold through Smyrna to, to Claris, rich in vines. Here, Apollo of the Silver Bow sits and waits for the goddess who shoots from afar and delights in her, in her arrows. So hail to you, Artemis, with my song, and at the same time to all the other goddesses as well. Yet I begin to sing about you first of all, and after I have made my beginning from you, I shall turn to another hymn. So Artemis is really, really important for us. As we said, the story of her birth uh, is about the mating of Leto and Zeus. And they, uh, Leto gives birth to the twin deities of Artemis and Apollo. Now, traditionally speaking, in this story, Artemis is born first. And interestingly enough, which is, of course, weird for us, she helps her mom with the delivery of her brother Apollo, therefore performing one of her primary functions and one of the primary symbols that she stands for as the goddess of childbirth as well. So she's also the goddess of childbirth, even though she herself was the virgin. Now, she was born on, Mon on mountain uh, Synthus in Delos. And, and that's why we call that uh, section Cynthia. And then according to Ovid, uh, you know, after the birth of uh, Artemis and Apollo, Leto was forced by the anger of Hera. Hera was, don't forget, Zeus's wife. So Hera was extremely angry that uh, Zeus had slept with Leto. And because of her anger, Leto was forced to wander around to go on her way to leave town with her two babies. And she came to Lycia. And, and it, it is interesting for us that the Lycians in this part refused to allow her to drink water from a marsh. So imagine the scenario which, is, which goes like this. She sleeps with Zeus, has two immortal children. Then Hera finds out about it and she is furious that her husband has slept with another woman. She sends them on her way. She banishes them from, from that place where they were living. And so they have to go to another city. They have to find another city. First, they go to Lycia. And of course, unfortunately, the Lycians are not very kind to her and do not allow her to drink water. And because she is angry with them, she changes all of those people into frogs. So because they don't let her drink from, uh, you know, the water in Lycia. 
So all of them are turned into frogs because they did not allow her to drink water. Uh, you know, on other occasions too, Artemis and Apollo work together and both of them act as very, uh, you know, powerful agents of destruction. They destroy whatever is on their way, in their way, how, whoever insults them. We will talk about this later, that, you know, Artemis is very, very careful about her virginity, about her chastity, and whoever, like, sees her naked, even if it is by chance, even if it is quite random and not on purpose, she will punish them severely. And so, in Greek mythology, both Apollo and Artemis become symbol, become agents of destruction. And, and they also become symbols for sudden death, particularly of young uh, people, of course. Now, after this Lycia uh, episode, where, uh, you know, the people of the, you know, Lycians do not allow them to rest there, to drink water there, and therefore they're turned into frogs, they go to another city, and that is one of the most famous stories about Artemis, the story of Niobe and, of course, her children. Now, Niobe was the queen of Thebes. Thebes is the name of the next city that they go to. And this is one of the most important stories about Artemis that you have to know about. This story is recounted in Ovid's Metamorphoses, and we are going to talk about it today. Now, when uh, Leto and her children arrive in Thebes, the women of Thebes are extremely kind to them. So they allow them to rest, they allow them to drink water. Niobe, who is the king, is actually angry that her people are kind to Leto because of so many different reasons. And she believes that the people of Thebes should, you know, give all of the credit, all of their praise to their own queen and not to some unknown woman called Leto. You know, because she says that, well, I am richer than Leto. I am more beautiful than Leto. I am the queen of Thebes. She even talks about this, that Leto has only given birth to two children, whereas me, I, Niobe, have given birth to seven sons and seven daughters. And because, well, I have more children, I have to be praised more than Leto. And that's why, of course, this kind of jealousy that, you know, uh, exists in Niobe's heart with regards to Leto, once again makes Leto extremely angry that, you know, there is such a very an arrogant queen called Niobe. And of course, Leto complains to Artemis, her own daughter, and of course, Apollo, her own son. And together, these two deities, they try to, you know, seek revenge. They try to avenge the insult that their mother has received from Niobe. So Apollo kills all of Niobe's sons with his arrows. And then Artemis, in turn, kills all of Niobe's daughters just because their mother was insulted. You know, at some point, you know, when only one child is remaining, Niobe starts begging Artemis to spare the last child because she's the youngest daughter. And she says, please forgive this last one. I really want this one to be alive. And then when she's saying her prayers and she wants forgiveness, suddenly Artemis turns her into stone. And then a wind comes and takes Niobe away and puts her on a mountaintop. And they believe that still to this day, water comes out of the, you know, the stony eyes of Niobe, which represents her crying and, of course, her begging Artemis to spare her last child. As I told you, all of these stories represents a quality about Artemis, which is important to understand. The fact that she's very fierce, she's very angry, she's very vindictive. She always wants to avenge uh, like uh, her brother uh, or, for example, her mother. She wants to have revenge on whoever insults her or her family. Another, and, and 
I have written here hollowed purity because some people argue that like this is meaningless. You know, yek bestela holuse tuchaliye, yani film bishtar, show off bishtar. A very famous story that represents this hollowed purity of goddess Artemis is of course the story of Actaeon. Now Actaeon uh, or Actaeon um, is again uh, another poor uh, human being who is also a hunter but then unknowingly uh, he comes across Artemis and sees her naked and just because of that it was not intentional it was just a, an honest mistake he was wandering in the you know in the jungle in the bushes and suddenly he sees a Diana of course Diana is the Roman version of Artemis he sees Diana naked and just because of that he is punished let's read the story of Actaeon now Actaeon was the first to tint with grief the happiness of his grandfather Cadmus a stag's horns grew on his head so this is the punishment that he receives which we hear about at the beginning of the story and his hounds feasted on their master's flesh. So the hounds, un sagoyam kedare, sagosh gushtesho mikoram. Barabinim chatori, chimisheke be injomirese. If you look closely, you will find that his guilt was misfortune, not a crime. He didn't commit a crime, it was just bad luck. What crime indeed lies in an innocent mistake? There was a mountain on which had fallen the blood of beasts of many kinds. It was midday, when shadows are at their shortest and the sun is midway in his course. Young Actaeon calmly called his fellow huntsmen as they tracked the game through the depths of the pathless forest. My friends, our nets and spears are wet with the blood of our prey. We have had luck enough today. Dawn's saffron wheel chariot will bring another day tomorrow and then uh, we can let me just zoom in a little uh, and then we will renew the chase the sun now stands midway betwixt between east and west and with his hot rays perches parches the earth stop now the hunt and take in the knotted nest his men obeyed and halted there from their labors there was a veil called gargaphy sacred to the hunters diana clothed with a dense growth of pine and pointed cypress so a part of the forest was you know associated with diana it had a, at its far end a woodland cave with uh, which no human hand had shaped on the right form a murmuring spring issued a stream of clearest water and around the pool was a grassy bank here with the woodland goddess rest when weary from the hunt so this is the part where diana or artemis would rest and bathed her virgin body in the clear water. That day she came there and to one of her nymphs handed her hunting spear, her quiver and bow, and arrows that were left. Upon another's waiting arms the, uh, she cast her cloak and two more took up her sandals, so she was getting undressed. Other nymphs fetched water and poured it from uh, ample urns. And while Diana was thus being bathed, as she had been many times before, Actaeon, Cadmus's great son, his labors left unfinished, came to the grotto, uncertain of his way and wandering through the unfamiliar woods. So Actaeon was still, you know, going through the woods. So fate carried him along. Into the dipping cave he went, and the nymphs, when they saw a man, beat their breasts and filled the forest with their screams. They surrounded Diana and shielded her with their bodies, but the goddess was taller than they, and her head overtopped them all. Just as the clouds are tinged with color when struck by the rays of the setting sun, or like the reddening dawn, uh, Diana's face flushed when she was spied naked, when Actaeon saw her naked. Surrounded by her nymphs, she turned and looked back, wishing that her arrows were at hand. She used what weapons she could and flung water over the young man's face and hair with these words, foretelling his coming doom. Now you may tell how you saw me naked, if you can tell, of course. With this threat, she made the horns of a long-lived stag rise on his head.
where the water had struck him. His neck grew long and his ears pointed. His hand turned to hoops, his arms to legs and his body she clothed with spotted deer skin and she made him timid. Etono, his valiant son, ran away in fear and as he ran, wondered at his speed. He saw his horned head reflected in a pool and tried to say, alas, but no words would come. He sobbed and that at least was a sound he uttered and tears flowed down his new changed face. So as we can see, well, he was punished, Actian, and then you can uh, read the story later on. And uh, he remained like this and everybody was, you know, uh, was looking for him. So all of his friends, all of his uh, huntsmen, all of his hounds, his dogs, were all looking for him, but nobody could see that this, uh, you know, animal was Actian himself. And unfortunately, his dogs started eating him. His, his dogs started attacking him. And of course, after some time, um, unfortunately, the hounds started eating him. And this is like a picture which depicts the story of uh, Actaeon. As you can see, the hounds are eating him. Okay, so there are so many different opinions about this story. Some people say, as we said, that Diana was really harsh. This was just a show off. She shouldn't have been really this cruel. But others say that because uh, purity and virginity was so important for her, her actions were justified. We have another story about <clears throat> Artemis, which is also important for us to uh, read. This story of Callisto and Arcus. Uh, you can read about Arcus in the PowerPoint presentation. I'm only going to talk about Callisto. This insistence on purity and chastity, of course, as I said, and then a kind of very cruel punishment for somebody who sees her naked or, you know, somebody who kind of insults her a little uh, can be found in all of Artemis's stories. And again, we have this story from Ovid's, uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, Okay, so once again, we have the story of uh, Callisto. Uh, and of course, we have the story of Arcus as well. So let's read the story of Callisto. As Jupiter journeyed back and forth to Arcadia, he saw the Arcadian girl Callisto. So Callisto in this story was a girl and she was very pure. She worshiped Artemis. She was also a hunter. You know, Jupiter, the god in the sky, uh, saw Callisto and said, oh my God, look how beautiful she is. And then uh, he decided to, you know, to, to rape her and then thought about his wife. He said, okay, well, maybe uh, my wife doesn't find out, but even if she finds out, it is worth it because this beautiful creature, you know, my wife will never discover this affair. And so, uh, you know, Jupiter says that, okay, I'm going to rape this girl and my wife will never find out. And, and therefore, he comes down to the jungle where Callisto is, you know, taking a bath or resting. And then Jupiter tries to, um, uh, you know, kind of rape Callisto. And when this happens, uh, he runs away. Now, Callisto is very, uh, is very ashamed of, of the fact that she has been raped. But then when she's on her way home, she sees Diana, Artemis, and all of her nymphs. And, and they all see in her eyes that she's sad about something. But of course, because Diana was a virgin, she didn't know that what rape was. So she couldn't really read between the lines and she couldn't understand that, uh, you know, um, Callisto had been raped. And then later on, when they take Callisto to take a bath, Again, in the in the jungle, in the bushes, just like the previous story of Actaeon. Uh, when uh, <clears throat> Artemis asks uh, Callisto to take off her clothes and to bathe in the holy waters, as soon as uh, she undresses, everybody sees that she has been raped. And therefore, you know, Diana believes that she has been willingly you know, sleeping with somebody. And because, well, Callisto is no longer a virgin, Diana once again punishes Callisto, this time a girl, 
for having lost her virginity. And as you can see again, in this story, we have a mythological goddess, Artemis, who is so concerned about purity and chastity that she punishes a girl who has been raped. Okay, so that's the story of Callisto. Okay, and uh, you can read about the story of Arcus as well, which is like the same story. Now, Arcus also, you know, is another, again, mythological figure who is punished uh, by Artemis simply because, you know, some issue of chastity uh, or some issue of purity is, of course, undermined. Okay, now later on, one of the punishments that Artemis considers for Callisto is that she becomes a bear. Okay, so that's the punishment that Artemis considers for Callisto. And of course, she becomes a bear. Uh, so Arcus is also another mythological figure who, uh, you know, is punished by Artemis and she also be, and uh, Arcus also becomes a bear when, uh, of course, Artemis uh, punishes him because of, uh, you know, because of, you know, some issue of purity, of course. Now, what happens here? Why am I telling you about the story of Arcus and Callisto? The reason why I'm telling you about this is that these are the stories that, you know, finally become some, you know, uh, related to the issue of astrology or even astronomy. Now, uh, when, of course, both of these uh, uh, creatures, poor creatures, Arcus and Callisto, are punished, both of them turn into bears. But then Jupiter, you know, kind of pities them and he says that, OK, they were punished unjustly. It was not a fair punishment. So let me do something nice to them. And so he comes down to Earth again, takes them on on his wings and takes them to heaven and makes them stars. And I'm sure you can guess by now that, you know, one of them becomes the great bear, uh, Ursa Minor, Major, and of course the other one becomes the little bear or Ursa Minor, Dobe Akbaru, Dobe Askar, in, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the stars. And this is one of the first stories which provide the etiology for stars, a mythological story, which also tells the story of stars and constellations in the sky. We have so many other stories like this in which a mythological story suddenly becomes a scientific one, sort of, uh, because it is about the stars and the constellation and astrology. And this is one of those stories. Both Callisto and Arcus were punished by Artemis. And of course, uh, uh, both of them uh, were taken to the sky by Jupiter and both of them were turned into constellations of uh, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. So I wanted to begin uh, our presentation and of course continue for, for some time talking about the cruelty of Artemis because this is what she is most known for. Well, and now let's talk about the origins of Artemis, where she comes from and, you know, some other uh, stories about her. The origins of this uh, mythological goddess, the origins are obscure. We don't have a lot of information. All we know about her is that she's a virgin goddess. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, in some other stories, she's also the goddess for fertility. So she has this paradox in her. In some stories, she's the virgin goddess. In some other stories, she's associated with fertility. As we said, she's also the goddess of childbirth because we know in her story that she was born first and then she helped her mother Leto give birth to Apollo. Uh, she also became the uh, goddess of the moon in classical times. And some people argue that the reason why she is believed to be the uh, the goddess of moon is because of uh, is is because they want to represent the women's uh, you know lunar cycle and of course their menstrual uh, menstrual periods. So that's why uh, Artemis is also she, because she was a virgin and uh, she also became the goddess of the moon. So a lot of people argue that she she represents women and their menstrual cycle. And this duality exists, of course, in her character, the duality of the virgin as well as the mother. 
because she helps people give birth. Now, one of the other important stories in Greek mythology about Artemis is the rivalry that exists between Artemis and Aphrodite. One of them is the goddess of virginity. The other one is the goddess of love and sexuality and sensuality. So it is important to see both of these creatures and how they fight. They might fight each other. And the story of the fight between Artemis, Artemis and Aphrodite is told to us in a play, in a tragedy called uh, Hippolytus. And it is written by Euripides, one of the greatest uh, dramatists and playwrights of ancient Greece. If you remember, we said that Euripides, Aeschylus, and Sophocles were the big three uh, and the greatest tragedy writers of ancient Greece. And Euripides has a story called Hippolytus, which is uh, the kind of story in which Artemis and Aphrodite kind of fight each other. So this is a fascinating story, and uh, we are going to talk about this story uh, in a little bit. Okay, so now we know that Artemis and Aphrodite are kind of like enemies in this story. And, you know, uh, Artemis kind of represents uh, kind of a negative force, which is like the other rejection of love. She rejects love no matter from who. But she, is also, she also has a positive side as well because, well, you know, she represents chastity and purity, right? And so living alone to be an ascetic and then to live alone and cherish your own uh, solitude and of course purity. And as I said, no one, literally no one has portrayed this kind of fight between Artemis and of course Aphrodite better than Hippolytus by Euripides. Now at the beginning of this story, um, at the beginning of this play by Euripides, you know, Aphrodite is extremely angry. Uh, you know, the reason why uh, is that Hippolytus, who is a very young, handsome man, rejects Aphrodite. So she is rejected by Hippolytus. And Hippolytus says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't want to get married. I don't want to sleep with you. And so this young man, of course, is punished by Aphrodite because of his arrogance because of his hubris and the, the way that Aphrodite wants to punish Hippolytus is he makes his stepmother fall in love with him so Hippolytus has a son this sorry has a father called Theseus Theseus has married for the second time and his second wife's name is Phaedra. Now, Phaedra is the stepmother of Hippolytus, but Aphrodite punishes Hippolytus by making Phaedra fall in love with his, with her stepson. So this is the first stage of the punishment for Hippolytus because Hippolytus rejected Aphrodite. Now, Phaedra's nurse uh, kind of tells uh, Hippolytus about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Phaedra is in love with him and Hippolytus is extremely angry. You know, he has never, he has never thought about love. He has never thought about, uh, you know, marrying a woman or sleeping with a woman. And even the very thought of it makes him sick. Now, imagine that he finds out that his own stepmother is in love with him and wants to sleep with him. This relationship it becomes kind of traumatic for Hippolytus. Now, you know, uh, Phaedra later on feels guilty and she tries to commit suicide, okay? And however, before she commits suicide, she leaves a note and falsely says that, you know, Hippolytus, you know, did something terrible to me. And that is the reason uh, uh, 
uh, that is the reason why I'm going to die. When uh, the father, Theseus, finds this note and, you know, thinks that uh, his son actually brought about the death of his second wife, Phaedra, he becomes extremely angry and he says that, well, I don't understand your piety. I don't understand your, you know, the fact that you don't want to sleep with women. So uh, Theseus, now that his wife has died, he says that it's ridiculous that my son does not want to sleep with any women. And so I want to kill him. And so, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting some messages. That's why I'm distracted a little. Anyway, so um, Hippolytus is, you know, is going to die because his father uh, wants to punish him, of course, and he kills him. But as he is dying, as Hippolytus is dying, Artemis, who is the goddess of purity, who is the god of virginity, appears on his deathbed and tells him, don't worry, uh, I will make, you know, I will make your name uh, immortal in history because you wanted to be pure, but of course Aphrodite didn't want you. And so she is the reason why you're going to die. But don't worry, I'm going to create a cult in your name. I'm going to make everyone worship you and, you know, uh, love you for your purity and for your chastity. Now, of course, at the end of the story, uh, suddenly uh, the, there, there is a kind of understanding between the father, Theseus, and the son. Uh, you know, one of the things that is interesting about this play is that, well, Euripides is, has always been famous for playing with the audiences. He never gives you the final answer. And this play is also like this. We don't have the final answer to see whose fault it was. So there are so many different questions at the end of the play uh, which make the analysis of the story even more difficult. So is Hippolytus a saint or is he foolish? We don't know. Has he destroyed himself because of rejecting Aphrodite or because, because of like reject uh, the rejection of the physical love by Aphrodite or no? Uh, this is just the, you know, the fault of the goddess Aphrodite because she cannot accept being rejected. Are human beings at the mercy of the ruthless and irrational compulsions in their very nature, which they defy as ruthless and vindictive women? So is it because of the women that we have all of these problems? Uh, or no, men are stupid. So all of these questions are presented to us and of course, we have this kind of fight between Aphrodite, who uses Phaedra as a kind of punishment for um, Hippolytus. And then we have Artemis, who says, well, this is meaningless. Well, Hippolytus wanted to be a virgin. Why are you forcing him? So, uh, as I said, one of the things, one of the uh, important uh, aspects which makes this play so fascinating to read and i really recommend it is because when you read the play not only are you going to learn more about the character of for example hippolytus theseus and phaedra there is also so much information about artemis and aphrodite in this work so it is a valuable source of information and so through this masterful play we can actually see the subtlety of the thought and the complexity of the characterization that uh, Euripides in includes in this play. So the characters are very complex. They are not one dimensional. And that's why we have all of these stories I told you about in the play, just because the characters are so multidimensional. One of the questions I, I talked about here is that is it really men's fault or women's fault that, you know, something like that happens? You know, a lot of people talk about some aspects of the play which they believe to be misogynistic. Misogyny is the hatred of women. 
the mistreatment of women. And so in this play, one of the things that this play also talks about is the misogyny of Hippolytus, the character. You know, in, in Euripides' play, after Hippolytus learns from the nurse that Phaedra, his stepmom, is in love with him, you know, he starts a speech, a monologue against women, a tyrant, an attack on women, and he, descri and he describes women as vile and evil. And a lot of critics have argued that this has made the story misogynistic because, well, uh, he talks quite terribly about women. He considers them as uh, worthless, as evil, forces of evil. And so he says that chaste men like me suffer because women are lustful and women are evil. Uh, and of course, some people argue that, well, he's not really at fault we cannot really blame him because, well, he wants to be a virgin. And so, you know, sleeping with any women, any woman would be traumatic for him and impossible for him. And now he suddenly realizes that his own stepmother is in love with him. And this is why he has a reaction like this. So, yes, the story is misogynistic in some parts, especially in this speech by um, Hippolytus. But of course, you have to see it from the perspective of the man who doesn't want to sleep with any women, but then women are trying to force their way on her. Uh, as we said, there are other critics who argue that, well, this is actually the views generally held in the Greek society, meaning that these views of women as being evil were actually very natural in the Greek society. And that is why a, a very important a uh, playwright like Euripides includes such controversial uh, aspects in her story, in his story. And so they argue that, well, this is how the Greeks viewed women. Um, and so, well, this kind of misogyny is, as I said, present. However, I would like to also talk about the opposite of misogyny in this story, and that's the concept of misandry. So the opposite of misogyny, misogyny is the hatred of women, and the opposite of misogyny is misandry or hatred of men. And it is important that un unfortunately, it is misandry which is always present when we are talking about Artemis. Do you remember all of the stories I told you at the beginning of this video? I told you that, you know, even when a man makes an honest mistake, like, for example, Actaeon. Actaeon was just walking in the forest because he was, you know, sort of lost. He wanted to go back to his fellow huntsmen and to his dogs and his hounds. But then suddenly came across a cave, went into the cave and saw the goddess Artemis naked. It was just an honest mistake. But because, of course, she's very wrathful and she's very angry, she punished her him so severely so that... Uh, horns grew on his head and he was finally hunted and killed by his own dogs. And so, of course, this concept of misandry or hatred of men is also associated with Artemis. This kind of hatred of men is also apparent in another group of people called the Amazons in Greek mythology. Now, the Amazons, if you are familiar with the, you know, superhero movies like Wonder Woman, you know who those um, you know, Amazons are. Amazons were a group of women who wanted to be as good warriors as men. They even wanted to be the best warriors and the best hunters in the world, even better than men. And so their, you know, their excellence in hunting was to be the same as men. And that's why they created a society for themselves with no men. There was no man in their society. Only women existed in the society which the Amazons had established for themselves. And, and this, of course, is another um, symbol of misandry or hatred of men, which also exists in Greek myth mythology, just like the story of Artemis. And finally, this is the death of Hippolytus that, of course, we have here. Uh, uh, on this beautiful vase. Uh, okay, so this is the end of our lecture for today about Artemis. Hopefully next week we will talk about uh, Apollo.
So thank you very much for watching the video and I hope to see you next week.